The main character's name is Mason. He just woke up and found himself on the roof of a multi-story building. His head was splitting as if after a long night spent in a nightclub. Mason was accompanied by a strong smell of rotten meat. He did not immediately understand why he was on the roof and not in his bed. The stench was clearly everywhere and screams and groans could be heard from below the building. Mason looked down and couldn't understand why there were so many people there. People were just stamping their feet and making strange sounds. It looked a bit like a strike, but something was not as usual. Mason looked closely and realized that it was not a strike or even people. It was a crowd of rotting zombies. As soon as Mason realized this, he was thrown off the edge of the roof. He was scared and didn't understand what was happening because a second ago he was in the normal world. Mason started looking for his phone and seeing what was going on online, but his pockets were empty. He had no money, no phone, no keys to his apartment. He only had a pack of peanuts with him. Mason remembered that he had bought them at the store the day before. Mason was upset. He thought that now he would definitely die. He would just gnaw the nuts and immediately go to the next world. The girl had never even existed, and he was already dying. Suddenly, a door opened sharply a few meters away from him. It was the incomparable Melanie, who had clearly been surviving in this world for more than one day. Her figure was emphasized by tight clothes that fit closely to her body. She didn't notice Mason, but he continued to watch this from around the corner like a fearless girl. At first, Mason didn't understand how to act, but he couldn't help but continue to watch her, her graceful, alluring gait. Melanie walked up to the barrel and pierced it with a knife. Water splashed out of her and began to flow down her body. Melanie slowly unbuttoned her latex top to let the water wash over her ample breasts. She washed the caked blood and dirt from her long legs and firm buttocks. Mason watched her, drooling from his mouth. He had never seen such a sexy girl. Mason lost his balance on one leg and a stone flew out from under his boot. Melanie heard it right away, because surviving in this world taught her to be sensitive and always ready for a fight. Before she could even button her clothes, she immediately rushed towards Mason. Having reached the corner, she saw Mason lying on the ground, confused, who only managed to say hello to her, and immediately received a good right hook to the face. Melanie took out her gun and pressed it to Mason's forehead, ordering him not to move, and Mason began to beg her for mercy. He didn't want anything bad. Melanie, without removing the gun from his face, immediately asked who he was and what he was doing here. Mason didn't even think about his life. His gaze was drawn to Melanie's feet, which were at once so close and so far away from him. Melanie looked closely at Mason and realized he was looking at her buttocks and not her face. For this, Mason gets another good punch in the face. He's starting to piss her off, and Melanie is ready to cut him into little pieces and feed him to those rotten zombies that have gathered downstairs. But the powerful, huge zombie behind her simply didn't let her finish what she started. She heard him approaching and ready to attack. Melanie managed to jump back in time. It wasn't a surprise for her, but Mason clearly didn't expect to see this, and only managed to think that before his death, he at least managed to look at the beauty. The monster bully immediately started with the defenseless Mason. Mason first thought that this monster belonged to Melanie and said that although he was looking at her curvy figure, he couldn't kill him for that. But Melanie understood perfectly well what danger lay before them and began to shoot. Bullets flew from both of Melanie's hands like in a real blockbuster. The mutant's skull was too thick for bullets to penetrate. However, it hit him in the eye and now he's just swinging his claws but if he keeps swinging like that and smashing everything around, he might attract a crowd of low-level zombies, which would definitely lead to a disaster. He shouldn't be allowed to do that. His upper body is huge, leaving little support for his lower body, and his right leg appears to have been broken before birth, making him a slow mover. Melanie analyzed the situation and got out the bandsaw. It had very sharp teeth and was designed specifically for fighting giant zombies. Now the mutant rushed at her, and judging by his size, he could simply crush her with one blow. Mason started screaming and asking her to run away from there quickly, but Melanie was clearly not a timid girl and had no intention of running away. She rushed to attack the huge mutant. With one swing of the bandsaw, she cut off his leg. The mutant was not agile, and without one leg he simply fell to the ground, and Melanie jumped on top and was able to hug his neck with a bandsaw. One sharp movement and the zombie's head was already lying on the ground. Mason was shocked by what he saw and would never have been able to believe that a small, fragile girl could do such a thing to a huge zombie. And Melanie had just taken out the mutant's core, which was of pretty good quality from his body. Melanie got off the zombie and was unhappy with only one thing. She had just taken a shower, and now she was covered in rotten blood again. Melanie turned her attention to Mason, who was squatting with his back turned to her. She asked why he was so cowardly and which camp he was from. Mason didn't believe that this was reality, he ate nuts and thought that this dream was very realistic. 
Now he will sleep it off and wake up in his bed. Melanie walked closer and took the peanut from Mason like she was a small child. Melanie looked at the nuts with bated breath and asked where he got the valuable longevity nuts from. Mason said that if she wanted some nuts too, she could have just asked instead of taking them all. Melanie got tired of this frivolous conversation. She put a bandsaw to Mason's neck and repeated her question about where he came from and where he found such rare food. The cold touch of the saw and the searing pain Mason felt when he cut himself made him finally realize that it was all real. He introduced himself and said that the peanuts were just a snack he bought at a regular supermarket. Suddenly, a bullet pierced Melanie's leg. They hadn't yet had time to realize it, and the pain from the bullet in her leg had just begun to reach Melanie when a hail of bullets rained down on them. They hid behind the wall. Mason was terrified. This had never happened to him in real life. Melanie's leg was bleeding profusely, and he said that Melanie urgently needed medical attention. Melanie realized that there were more zombies in this area for a reason. People appeared here. Meanwhile, a group of bandits were discussing from the roof of another building that it was a great idea to lure zombies here so that Melanie could kill them, and then they could profit from the easily obtained cores. One of the bandits got a little scared when he saw Melanie dealing with the zombies and asked the leader if she would come for them to avenge the bullet in her leg. The boss said that there was cadaveric poison in this bullet, and now Melanie's death will not be long in coming. Meanwhile, Melanie's leg began to swell, and she realized that it was cadaveric poison. Melanie said that even though her body had evolved and she now had immunity, this poison was much more serious than a normal infection and this time she could die. Realizing this, Melanie began to cry and told Mason that people from the 17th camp were shooting at them. They needed the zombie fruit that she got. If they met them, they would definitely kill them. Mason asked in horror what they should do now. Melanie said she could hold them off long enough for Mason to escape, but what would happen to Melanie? Melanie said that there was cadaveric poison in her and only penicillin could neutralize it. If Mason did not leave, then very soon Melanie would turn into a zombie and then Mason would definitely not be able to leave. She asked Mason to find her sister and tell her to run because without her protection, the bandits from Camp 17 would catch her and do something terrible to her. And if she ran, she would at least have a chance. Mason said that he might be able to find penicillin and save her, but Melanie said that it was almost impossible because it was one of the rarest things in the world. Melanie threw a few smoke bombs and said she would shoot back and when the smoke rose, Mason could escape through the door she came through. She gave Mason a note and said that her sister was here, and when he found her, they absolutely had to run. Melanie started shooting back and ordered Mason to run. Mason rushed to the exit, but all he could think about was that he couldn't just leave Melanie because she had saved his life, and he had to repay her in kind. Mason just thought that he wanted to return to his world because penicillin is available in any pharmacy, the system immediately worked, and a voice in his head asked if he really wanted to return to his world. Mason asked the system again if he would be able to return back if he were transported to his world for a while. The program responded that he could return at any time. Then Mason said that he needed to move to the real world right now. Mason woke up in a hospital bed. The voices of passersby and motorists could be heard from the street. The world was the same, and the foul smell was no longer there. Mason walked out into the hospital corridor, where life went on as usual. Mason ran headlong down the corridor. He ran quickly and shouted only one word, penicillin. Meanwhile, Melanie was sitting on the roof. The poison consumed Melanie piece by piece. She thought of only one thing. She wanted Mason to definitely get to her sister and warn her of the danger. The shooting stopped, and the bandits thought that Melanie was no longer able to fight back. Their boss said it was time to reap the fruits of their labor. Mason was stopped by a nurse and told that he couldn't run in the hallways. He saw the nurse with a tray of pills. Without thinking twice, Mason grabbed all the pills under his shirt, after which he immediately started running, not reacting in any way to the nurse's cries and started running again. He told the program that he urgently needed to be transferred to another world. Melanie continued to sit motionless on the roof, lifeless. Suddenly, a finger touched her face. Luckily, it was Mason. He asked if she was still alive, to which Melanie simply turned to face him. But Melanie didn't like it. She hoped that he was already warning her sister, and he returned to her when she was almost a zombie. Melanie furiously asked why he returned. Mason anticipated her negative reaction and immediately took out a bottle of penicillin. He said he had come to save her and took a bottle of penicillin with him. Melanie couldn't believe her eyes where he got it from. Mason asked her to ask fewer questions. She need not worry. It was real penicillin. It was too early to die. They would get out of here together in their right minds and sound memory. After these words, Mason handed her a pill. Melanie swallowed the pill, even though she didn't trust Mason, but she had no choice. 
A few minutes passed and Mason asked her how she was feeling. Melanie examined her leg. It was back to normal and there were no signs of infection. Melanie couldn't believe that the poison had been suppressed in such a short time. What kind of penicillin was it? Just as Melanie put on her boot, the door to the roof opened. These were the same bandits. Their boss ordered to find the little creature and take the monster's core. And if you're lucky, you can have some fun if it's still warm. Melanie came around the corner with a bandsaw and asked if that was the one they wanted to have fun with. She said that she was just about to start looking for them, and they came to her themselves. How is this possible? How could she survive? The bandits clearly decided to escape from there as quickly as possible. Mason was waiting for Melanie in the apartment. Terrible sounds of violence were heard from above. He thought that she clearly would not need help. On the table, he found a notebook, neatly lying in the corner. Mason started to leaf through it. It was a personal diary. But who would write something like that? July 21st, 2080, sunny outside, plump young woman from the house across the street went out into the street again to hang out her clothes. She appears on the street from time to time. A trifle, but nice. And what a figure she has. July 22nd, partly cloudy. Today, a new manager was transferred to the company, who was seated next to me. She must be training a lot because her butt is just space. Maybe I don't like the woman from the house across the street that much. The new girl's ass just makes you drool. There are rumors of a virus outbreak in a neighboring town, but I hope it doesn't reach them. Something happens to the girl. Her body becomes covered in spots. She becomes not herself. The guy sits under the table in horror and watches his manager's transformation. So they began to appear in the real world. Unexpectedly, gradually, without warning, the company was immediately quarantined. They even limited me to four walls and didn't allow me to leave. July 24th, the virus had hit most of the city. Residents were left with minimal provisions. Calls to the people responsible for my confinement were going unanswered. If this continued, I might just die of hunger. On July 25th, despite the ban on leaving, I broke the door lock and decided to find food on my own. However, I was overcome with horror when I came out. The city was destroyed and seemed abandoned. When I arrived at the supermarket, there were real fights over food. People went crazy with vandalism and looting, grabbing whatever they could. After I managed to get some food and medicine, I saw the infected biting people. On August 22nd, two days ago, the television signal suddenly disappeared, and the presenter on the last recording said that no one would come to help, and we could only help ourselves. I even thought it was a little funny. On August 17th, all the food ran out, but I'm afraid that if I leave the room, I might be eaten by hordes of infected. The last few days, I've been filling my stomach with water and really missing the manager's juicy ass. Suddenly, I heard the screams of a woman from the neighboring house, whom I periodically watched from the window. Her own husband attacked her and stabbed her to death. I just couldn't believe it. My own husband killed my neighbor. He was sitting over her corpse. What was he doing there? He seemed to sense my intense gaze and began to turn around. Drops of blood dripped from his mouth. I quickly bent down and hid so that he wouldn't have time to notice me and come after me. On August 19th, after four days without food, I was simply dying. And when I was already in complete despair, someone knocked on my door. This man was looking for penicillin. He exchanged a huge pile of food for my penicillin. It really worked better than the most powerful antibiotics. It was even hard to believe that antibiotics did not work. But some simple penicillin was the most powerful medicine. When I was on the balcony on August 21st, I found a man below who was eating dead zombies. How can he even do that? He took a clot out of their head, which he ate without leaving the zombies, wondering if it was really edible. On August 30th, I discovered that all my penicillin had been stolen. It was my only hope for salvation. On September 1st, I decided to leave this cage-like house. Even if the world around is full of infected people, I am not going to die of hunger in my room. So I came face to face with a zombie for the first time. I took out a kitchen knife and there were only two options. Either the zombie would eat me or I would eat it. This was the last entry in the diary. It seems the author of this diary never survived his first encounter with a zombie. Anyway, the diary gave Mason an understanding of what was happening in this world. People infected with the virus were turning into zombies that ate people. And judging by the current food shortage situation, most people were already infected. And the most important thing here is him. Penicillin is worth more than gold in this world. And the most important thing is that Mason could easily buy it in his world. And that meant only one thing. Suddenly, Mason felt a gun at his head again. It was the gangster boss. He now understood how Melanie was able to survive. They had a jar of penicillin. A moment later, Mason was already on his knees, and the boss was looking at the jar of penicillin. It was full. He couldn't believe his eyes, because if he gave it to his bosses, he would be promoted three steps forward. 
But Mason was not so lucky. Because he could go to hell, he immediately realized that he was on the verge of death and said that he still had some. Melanie suddenly entered the apartment. The boss took Mason hostage and warned Melanie that if she took one more step, Mason would be no more. Melanie said that if he shot, then her reaction would not be long in coming. She demanded to let Mason go, and then she would leave him alive, especially since it was worth listening to the sounds outside. The noise of gunfire and the smell of fresh human blood has attracted a large group of zombies, and if they don't go their separate ways right now, they will all die together at the hands of the rotting dead. The gangster boss's name was Logan, and he knew perfectly well that the meeting with the zombie group could be the last. But at the same time, he did not want to let go of such a golden guy as Mason. Logan was thinking about what was the right thing to do, and Melanie continued to demand that Mason be released. She killed so many of Logan's brothers, he promised revenge. Logan pushed Mason into Melanie and released the harpoon, catching himself on a nearby building. He began to climb the chains to the neighboring building on automatic traction and promised that the next time they met, he would cut Melanie into pieces and feed her to the zombies. Mason, meanwhile, was already calm and pressed his face to Melanie's chest. Melanie asked Mason if he would let go on his own or if he needed a little help. The city was enveloped in a dark night. Hordes of zombies continued to wander aimlessly through the streets. Melanie looked out the window and said that they were far enough away from these walkers that, after they rested a little, they could set off again. Melanie looked at Mason with her bright blue eyes and said that she wanted to clarify a few things. Firstly, who he was and where he got such rare things as peanuts and penicillin, which ordinary people have long since ceased to have. Mason didn't answer right away. He thought that although Melanie looked like a very capable girl, she would never reveal her cards, which meant that he shouldn't reveal his cards right away either. He needed to somehow dodge the answer. Mason sat down on the table and tossed Melanie a pack of penicillin. Melanie hadn't seen him for so long that it felt like she was holding not penicillin in her hands, but a large piece of gold. Mason said that she could have the entire jar as payment for saving him, and if Melanie promised to follow him and protect him, she could get more. Melanie asked Mason again how serious his intentions were. He said that if Melanie agreed, he would give her not only penicillin, but also many other valuable things in this world. Melanie couldn't believe he had anything more important than penicillin. Mason began to tell a very tasty story. Steamed lamb, bear paw, roast duck and chicken, steak, burger, roast goose, marinated salted duck, chicken and sauce, bacon, preserved eggs, dried meat, sausage, smoked chicken with white belly, steamed pork. Melanie stood there imagining these dishes and her stomach began to hurt. She asked Mason to stop. She wiped away her drool and said that she would not agree to defend him only for these things, especially since he could turn out to be a person from the camp of her opponents. But Mason hastened to reassure her, because he did not belong to any camp. He said that Melanie might think of him as a spoiled, handsome man who would turn her life into paradise. But Mason thought to himself that he was just an unlucky 21st century worker. Melanie thought he certainly looked like a spoiled brat, but she survived thanks to the penicillin he gave her. And although she hated to admit it, he was clearly her savior. After thinking for a moment, Melanie said that she was in. From now on, she would always follow him and protect him. But if she found even a hint that his words were a lie, then she would cut him into small pieces and cook him into cutlets. Mason was pleased with himself because he had earned the trust and now the accompaniment of a beautiful girl. And now she would always be with him. And maybe he would finally have physical intimacy with a real girl. Mason said that now that there was a verbal agreement between them, he wanted to ask something, namely, what had happened to the world? Melanie, like a real school teacher, began to conduct a mini tour of the world. The culprit of the end of the world is a virus that has turned normal people into zombies, with the infection rate being approximately 80%, reducing the planet's population from 9 billion to 1, and the rest of the people have become the walking dead. The zombie core has both plant and mineral properties. When directly ingested, it provides the body with a large amount of energy for a short period of time. However, if you prepare an evolution potion, then there is the possibility of evolving with various effects on the body. Evolution potions are divided into three levels. The first level provides the possibility of evolution by 20%, the second level by 30%, and the third by 35%, and they can be used separately or together to increase the chances of evolution. Due to the rapid adaptation of the virus, good powerful antibiotics quickly became ineffective. Namely, penicillin could constantly and quickly destroy the infection. But since the microorganisms that synthesize it also mutated, penicillin became an especially valuable medicine for saving lives. 
As soon as the virus began to affect humanity and people realized that it was impossible to defeat, people began to unite into groups. At the moment, there are three organizations operating in the city. These are Camp 17, Earth Construction, and Ascending Together. The group they met earlier were from Camp 17. They are the real bandits, openly burning, killing, and robbing everyone in their path, have a lust for all kinds including women. Their leader kills for pleasure and even feeds on human flesh. Mason thought a little about all of Melanie's words, and in general, the situation in the city was clear to him. Melanie looked outside and said that there were a lot of zombies around, and since Mason couldn't do anything at all, they should look for a place to spend the night and only leave at dawn. Mason sat on the bed and Melanie sat next to him on the couch. She told him to go to bed because he was of little use, so she would be on guard. He looked closely at her face. It was hard to imagine that she was as combative as he had seen her some time ago. Mason laid down on his bed and said he needed to travel back to the 21st century. The system has started the transfer. Mason opened his eyes slightly. He felt a little heavy, as if someone was sitting on him. When he opened his eyes fully, he saw a busty girl in front of him, who in a gentle, sweet voice asked him if he was awake. Mason quickly got out of bed and pushed the girl away from him. The girl was his mistress. He asked why she came to him. The owner said he was hit by a car, but the doctor said he would be fine. It was a good thing she had set up an emergency contact, otherwise the hospital wouldn't have been able to find anyone to pay his hospital expenses. Mason asked when she had managed to do all this, but the hostess did not listen to him and asked what he would like to eat. Mason felt awkward at being shown so much concern. The hostess laughed playfully and she even felt embarrassed that Mason was so embarrassed. She got out of bed and said that she would go buy him everything he needed. Mason really needed some things that he could take to the parallel world. And he agreed. While no one was there, he needed to figure out the system. He realized that if he accessed the system, a kind of menu would appear on his hand. There were only three icons, memory, transfer, and charging. He immediately had a logical question about how to charge it and how much charge was left. Literally 10 minutes passed and the girl was already back, out of breath from the weight of two large bags. Mason quickly got out of bed and wanted to help, but the girl said that he shouldn't overexert himself. He just needed to rest. The girl's name was Emma. She was very rich and constantly showed attention to Mason. He understood this perfectly well, but given that he had no money at all, he considered himself unworthy of her and did not reciprocate her feelings. But suddenly, a brilliant idea came to his mind. If he had such a unique system, then, with the help of trade between worlds, he would be able to get rich both there and here. Suddenly, the door to the room opened sharply. It was Emma's uncle, and she asked him with displeasure what he was doing there. Uncle said he had come to pick her up and take her to Liam's for dinner. Emma got angry and said that she would not go to his place for dinner because she had her own plans. Her uncle didn't listen to her and simply pushed her out of the room because it was a direct order from her father. Her uncle closed the door of the room in front of her and told her to wait downstairs. He had a serious conversation with Mason. He walked silently over to Mason's bed and looked straight at him. Mason asked what problems he had. Uncle said that the problem should have solved itself. Wasn't the money they offered Mason enough? Mason suddenly asked, what if he became rich? Uncle thought for a moment and said that there was a good phrase. A small man always has big ambitions, but he knew everything about Mason. Therefore, he is sure that, having lived his whole life, Mason will never reach the top. However, Mason did not agree with him, and his words sounded like a challenge to action to him. In another world, the sun has already begun to shine. Melanie actively tried to wake Mason up. Mason woke up yawning a little, and Melanie looked out the window and said that it would take about an hour to get to their base from here. The streets were filled with hordes of zombies. Melanie walked boldly along the steep roof of the former shops, and Mason, holding onto the wall in horror, followed her. After an hour's journey, they stopped at the edge of one of the roofs. Melanie threw a pebble at the neighboring building, and from this building, a suspension bridge began to descend, after which they entered the base via this bridge. Mason said the base was very well hidden. From the outside, he would never have guessed there was anything there. Melanie moved boldly through the corridors of the base, and Mason followed her silently. She entered the room where a completely bandaged girl lay. Apparently, she had been bitten and was covered in spots, the infection had already begun to completely consume her body. It was her sister, Becca, and Melanie immediately gave her a penicillin tablet, happily informing her that she would soon be better. Mason asked what happened, why her sister looked so bad. Melanie said that she was wounded by zombies. She went on a sortie specifically to get the core of a mutant zombie. She could exchange it for penicillin, but was ambushed. Becca asked if she was okay and if she was hurt. Melanie said she was fine, and she brought a friend who got them penicillin, and if it weren't for him, they would never have met again. 
Becca, although she did not see Mason, immediately thanked him for saving her. He was a little uncomfortable because he got these drugs quite easily. He was amazed how two fragile girls were able to survive in such a terrible world. Melanie prepared the food and handed the plate to Mason. He was very happy about it. Because they had been on their feet all day, he quickly pounced on the food and began chewing. But he immediately spat out the entire contents into the trash can. Melanie happily devoured the contents of her plate and asked Mason in surprise if he really didn't like it at all. Mason almost threw up and asked if they always ate this here. He even started to cry a little. Melanie asked again if the food she had prepared was really that bad. Mason said that they should stop eating such garbage. Melanie replied that she had a hard time fishing it all out of the river. Mason began to look through his pockets and asked Melanie to open her mouth. What Mason put in her mouth was simply delicious. This rich, milky taste is simply divine sweetness. Melanie froze and didn't move. Even though there was a storm of emotions in her head, Mason waved his hand in front of her face and said that it was just ordinary toffee. Melanie finally came to her senses and said it was amazing. He must have had one more candy, and he immediately began looking for it in his pockets. He put the second candy in Melanie's mouth. Melanie closed her mouth greedily and began chewing right into Mason's fingers. It was truly delicious. Mason was already a little afraid of her. She asked if he could get more of these candies. Now Mason was careful not to put candy in her mouth and put everything he had on the table. Melanie immediately gave one candy to her sister. The candy melted in her mouth and filled her not only with energy, but also with positivity. She immediately asked where such a treat came from, to which Melanie replied that their friend had given them the candy. The swelling began to slowly subside from Becky's face after she took the pill, and the candy brought back happiness and the desire to live. Mason felt sorry for these girls. They were happy with such simple things. He couldn't resist and dumped all the food he had on the table. Melanie couldn't believe her eyes. These were the delicious things she had so often read about in books. Is this really all for the two of them? Melanie asked. To which Mason replied that they don't have to worry because he still has many like him. She thought for a moment and decided to thank him. She took out a filled bag and handed it to Mason. He asked what was in it. Melanie said that these were all the cores she had managed to collect and now they belonged to him. As soon as she handed him the cores, the seal on her left hand began to burn. Could they be connected somehow? Mason agreed to take them, but asked again if she was sure that she wanted to give them all at once. Apparently, it was a very valuable thing. The penicillin he gave them saved their lives, and the same food costs much more. But later, she will collect more nuclei and pay off the entire debt. Mason took the bag of kernels and asked if they had a toilet. Melanie said it was around the corner. He went into the toilet, which was just a hole in the floor which was obviously very deep. But there was nothing else to wait for, so Mason set about executing the plan. While he is alone, it is time to study how the cores and the program interact in his body. He brought one core to his hand and it began to be sucked inside. A second later, it disappeared completely. The voice in my head said that the charge was replenished. The transfer possibilities were plus two. The total number of transfer possibilities was three. Mason decided he needed to recharge some more. While he was refilling the charge over and over again, the cores began to spill out of the bag into the toilet. The charge has already been replenished to nine transfer capabilities. Mason decided that nine were enough for now, and the remaining cores. He looked closely at the bag and was surprised to see where the rest of the cores were. Mason looked into the toilet and realized that they had all spilled into the toilet, which was smelling terrible. His face just turned pale. Mason came out of the toilet so upset that he looked like a ghost. Melanie immediately asked what happened to him, to which he replied that he just had digestive problems. Melanie put the porridge she had prepared back on the table and said that Mason needed to eat to regain his strength. Mason didn't understand why they had to eat it again when he had given them so much delicious food. But Melanie said that it was impossible to eat such valuable food every day, especially since she tried very hard and caught the ingredients from the river. It was impossible to let the good stuff go to waste. Mason stopped Melanie and said that there was no need to save. If needed, he would bring more. She ate her porridge and said that he had given them all the food he had. She didn't know he had any supplies in the system storage, and getting more food right now would be very strange. But his supplies were clearly not enough for the three of them to last a few days, so they needed to go back and get more. Mason made up a story. He said that he was a merchant, and he was constantly brought supplies for trade, so there would always be enough food. But why didn't he say it right away? Mason said that he didn't trust Melanie right away, but tomorrow he would go for the goods and bring more food. A new day has dawned. Mason said he would go get the goods, but Melanie stopped him. She put a revolver in his hand. But why is this revolver so small? Melanie replied that it doesn't matter at all. The main thing is that it is suitable for stealth killings. 
Mason thanked her and said that he would be back very soon. Immediately after the door slammed, Becca got out of bed. Melanie was pleasantly surprised. She said that the pills that the guy brought worked very well. Becca took off her bandages and asked Melanie to follow him to see where he was going. His behavior and appearance are not like the locals, and he also knows very little about our world. The words that he is a merchant are most likely just a lie, to distract attention. Although he is extremely generous to them, it is too early to trust him. Mason walked for a long time through the buildings of the city. He went into some room, looked around. It seemed like no one was following him and he could get down to business. It's time to move into the real world. He woke up in the hospital again and decided it was time to be discharged, because he had no money at all for such a long stay in the hospital. This month, he couldn't find a job again. His savings were running low, they were about to run out, before it seemed to him that he could get rich. But in fact, he was just a poor man. But now he needed to take valuable food for that world. Food and medicine are very valuable in that world. But he has no buyers at all. If he goes to that camp of scumbags, they will simply take everything and finish him off. Mason placed a whole bunch of groceries on the checkout counter and asked to check out. Although Melanie was quite strong, the most she could help him with was not becoming zombie food. But she said that there were peaceful camps. Maybe it was worth starting to trade with them. The total came to $1,000. Mason came home with full bags. There was still enough space in the system storage. He needed to grab some more change of clothes. Half a core was needed for one move. He needed to try to save them. He remembered that toilet with regret. In fact, he shouldn't have been so economical if all the kernels hadn't spilled into it. Melanie peered into the distance and tried to figure out where Mason had gone, but he just seemed to have disappeared. Was she really that bad at tracking? She stood on the roof of the building and believed that here she had an excellent place for observation. Here she would be able to understand where he went. Mason moved back, more prepared. He decided to put some of the things in a backpack so that they wouldn't suspect anything. Last time there were much fewer zombies here. It would have been better to get around them somehow. But the further Mason went, the more zombies accompanied him. He was already at the edge of the roof, but there was a whole horde of zombies there. It was clearly impossible to get through here. In front of him, there were only a few wires that could be used to get to the next building. He thought it was better not to take any risks and go back. However, some zombies had already climbed onto the roof and were following his juicy, tender body. He had to come up with something urgently because the happy zombies were running after him. One of the zombies pushed him off the roof. He began to fall quickly and food flew around. However, at the last moment, Mason quickly managed to grab the wires and the zombies simply fell down. Mason began asking to be transported to the real world. But the program said that at the moment the passive climbing ability is used, there is room for improvement. Mason was hanging onto the wires with all his might. The program said he had seven skill points. The cost of upgrading was one skill point, and upgrading again cost two points. Mason didn't listen to the program at all and shouted, improve twice. The system reported that the passive climbing ability was improved by two levels, three skill points were spent. It was cool. Now Mason could hold the wire with one hand. It was just some kind of miracle. He could also walk on the wire just like on the ground. Maybe now he is a real Spider-Man. He crawled along the wire, mimicking Spider-Man, while Melanie quietly watched him. She thought that Mason was just a softy, but in fact he was very clever after all. Becca was right. He is not as simple as it might seem at first glance. Mason finally jumped onto the roof of another building. That road was filled with zombies. He decided to climb higher to find another way to the base. He looked around and decided to climb another building. Mason immediately began to climb the building's cliffs. He was curious if there were any other skills in this system. He wanted to try them out as soon as possible. On one of the floors, Mason stopped and looked out the window. The building was filled with walking office dead. They saw Mason in the window and immediately rushed to attack, but the glass did not allow them to do so. He didn't climb any higher and decided to look at them up close, being confident that the glass would not let them reach him. However, the crowd of office zombies didn't think so. Under the weight of their bodies, the glass cracked, and that's when Mason realized that not everything was as wonderful as he thought. The glass broke and he fell. He managed to grab the edge of the floor and began to fight off the zombies with his other hand. With one wave of his hand, he cut off the zombie's head. His arms became so strong that he could easily cut off a zombie's head with one blow, the second zombie, and immediately the second blow. The head came off, just like the first zombie. However, Mason realized that even if he was Edward Scissorhands, he simply would not be able to cope with such a crowd of zombies. It's time to get out of there quickly. It was a rather dangerous game because if they pierced even a piece of skin, you could say goodbye to your life. In this world, it was clearly not worth showing off. 
By the way, Mason felt like it suddenly became easier to move around. Where did the backpack with food go? The backpack fell with all its contents. Mason even started to cry. Why does it always turn out like this? He didn't bring anything back during this trip. All the valuable things were lost, but he spent all his hard-earned fortune on them. He was going to save this money for his funeral, and he couldn't just say goodbye to it. He simply had to return it at any cost. He crawled to the window again and lured the zombie with his fresh, tender, fleshy hand. Zombies, like animals, began to jump out of the window in the hope of feasting on his hand. The office zombies decided to fly a little bit for the last time. It looked like all the zombies were already in flight. Mason's arm even went a little numb from such a large number, but it looked like the zombies were gone. Mason climbed into the building and took his backpack. He thought that they were not something to be afraid of. You just need to be smart. But something was clearly moving quickly behind him. He definitely saw a red shadow, or maybe he just imagined it. It wasn't just a shadow. It wasn't even just a zombie. It was a mutant. Moreover, he was very fast and agile, and he also wanted to taste Mason. The mutant hovered over Mason, and he had absolutely no idea what to do. Drops of blood from his mouth began to drip onto Mason's face, and after a second's wait, the mutant rushed to attack. One blow sent Mason flying out of the office space. However, realizing the full danger of the situation, he immediately started running. However, this mutant was not so simple. His speed was enormous, and Mason for him was just another living toy, which he could easily dine on. He ran as fast as he could, but the mutant was so fast that Mason didn't even see it coming. If he was transported to the real world, he would end up here again when he returned, so it was just a waste of cores. The mutant was already very close and Mason said that he wanted to spend all his remaining points on improvements. All points spent. Climbing speed improved to level 6, special skills, bravery and prudence, and firm step also received. At that very moment, Mason managed to dodge the attacking mutant. Now he saw all his movements and still managed to dodge attacks. The mutant was still chasing Mason. He had spent all his points and this only made them equal in speed, but he still couldn't escape from him. Mason hoped that after such a pumping of abilities, he would be able to pin him down and destroy him. But he would not be able to run at such a speed for long. His strength was quickly leaving him. If you slow down even for one second, he will catch up with him and grab him by the neck to bite. But something had to be done, and Mason had a plan. He stopped abruptly. This is exactly what the mutant was waiting for. He would finally get to enjoy some fresh flesh. Mason managed to grab a piece of a stick, and he aimed it at the flying mutant. Due to the mutant's enormous speed, the stick entered his body like a knife through butter. She pierced the mutant who was screaming in pain right through. Mason crawled into the mutant's soft skull in search of its core, and fortunately, he was able to get it. It was simply shining in his hands because it was his first well-deserved core. He was exhausted from the fatigue of running, but at the same time he was glad that it was all worth it. A few minutes later, Mason walked out of the building with a backpack over his shoulder, and Melanie was watching him from the roof. She knew perfectly well that the building was simply teeming with zombies, and she couldn't believe that he had managed to get out. Mason didn't notice her, and thought that at the moment, in terms of strength, he was about on the same level as Melanie. Following Melanie's example, he threw a pebble, and the entrance to their shelter opened. Mason immediately began calling the girls so that they could look at the new things that he had been able to bring them with such difficulty. At the door, he was met by Becca, who had changed greatly since their last meeting. She was a young girl, dressed in short shorts and a t-shirt that hugged her huge breasts. Mason didn't even immediately understand who was standing in front of him, because when she was all bandaged, he didn't even see her face. The girl winked at him and introduced herself. Didn't he recognize her? She came close to him and began to touch his body, asking where the blood on his clothes came from, how he felt and if he was injured. Becca pressed her chest against him and began to rub against his body. She said that she would rather examine him completely. Mason couldn't even imagine this. Could his dreams really be coming true? Such a cute girl wants to examine him completely and even rubs her big breasts. He already began to think that this world is not so bad. She visually examined Mason and said that she did not find any bites, so he really was fine took his hand and asked him to come wash with her because he was so dirty. Mason didn't immediately understand what Becca wanted. He asked again if she really was inviting him to take a shower together. Becca said that water sources were very limited right now, winked again, and said that they needed to conserve. Warm water was already pouring over Becky's body. She was the first to enter the shower completely naked. Water was running down her huge breasts and she was simply luring Mason to join her. He was a virgin and could never even dream of such a thing. Becca kept calling Mason over and over again, and he asked her if her sister would be against it. But Becca was quick to reassure him, as she and Melanie often bathed together. 
Mason stood in front of the entrance and could not decide whether to go in. He quickly took off his clothes and said that if he did not come in, it would be a clear sign of disrespect, so he should not refuse. He had already approached Becca from behind and wanted to get comfortable. Looking at her tender, young, wet body, drool just rolled out of his mouth. But someone grabbed him by the hair from behind. It was Melanie, who was clearly not happy with his behavior. She asked rudely what else he was doing and pulled his head towards her. Mason said that he didn't really have time to see anything since he's had minus eight vision since childhood. He can't even see anything in front of him. They got out of the bath and Mason immediately decided to change the subject of the conversation so as not to test Melanie's patience. He began to get everything that he managed to convey from the real world. To ensure a balanced diet, he even took some fruit with him. Melanie immediately forgot about everything that had happened before because she had only seen bananas in pictures. Mason unwrapped one banana for her and told her she could eat it right now and not be embarrassed. He began to push the banana into Melanie's mouth. It went in slowly and quite tightly because she actively licked it with her tongue to make it easier to enter her mouth. Mason's thoughts were completely off the banana as he continued to slowly push it into Melanie's mouth. The banana was already quite wet, but in order to better and more clearly feel its taste, she continued to polish it with her tongue. Finally, a piece of banana broke off and remained in her mouth. She was filled with delight at its sweet taste. Mason closed his eyes and replayed the moment over and over in his mind. A few minutes later, Becca was already out of the shower and seeing so many products, she thought that she was in a dream. Would Mason really give it all to them? It was very expensive. But Mason said that he understood perfectly well the value of these things in this world. But he had promised to be generous to them if they would protect him. Melanie finally swallowed a piece of banana and thought that now she definitely had to keep her promise. Mason said that with his savings, he would only be able to stock up once. And he would also have to figure out a way to get the cores. Melanie asked him again why he needed money. Because now it was just priceless paper. It was even inconvenient to wipe your ass with it. To which Mason replied that his trade was based on the exchange of rare metals, gold, silver, or something else in that spirit. Melanie looked around and walked away somewhere. She walked up to the table and took something out from under it. On the table where Mason was sitting, she placed several yellow bars that looked very much like gold. They sparkled like real gold bars. Mason reached out his hands to them and began to touch them. Are these really real gold bars? Melanie said she couldn't even remember what it was called. But the bars were square, so she decided to put them under the legs of the table to keep it from wobbling. If this one suits Mason, she has five or six more just like it under her desk. Mason even started to sweat a little when he saw so much gold in front of him, and Melanie opened a bag of chips and ate them with great pleasure, saying that they were not using it, and he could take it all. It was already completely dark outside. Mason lay there and couldn't stop rejoicing that he was now truly rich. While he was sleeping, someone entered his room. Mason was completely oblivious to this, and his dreams were only about how he would now be able to spend his new wealth. However, he did not even suspect that all his dreams, like reality, could end in an instant. Becca was already standing in front of him with a knife raised up. She was already lowering the knife to stop Mason's dreams forever. However, her hand was stopped by Melanie. They quietly asked Becca what she was doing, what had come over her. Becca said that if they killed Mason right now, all his valuables would belong to them. Melanie said that they couldn't do that because he had saved them. If it weren't for the penicillin that he had given them for free, they would both have joined the company of the dead who wandered aimlessly through the streets. Becca reminded Melanie of how not long ago another guy managed to gain her trust and then betrayed them, telling their location to the bandits. Then everyone from their camp died. Did she really want a repeat? If Melanie hadn't stopped Mason, he would have lost his lustful eyes in his soul. Melanie insisted on her own because Mason had no reason to spend something as valuable as penicillin on them. Even if they sold everything they had, they wouldn't even earn five penicillin tablets, and Mason gave them a whole pack. He's definitely not a traitor. Suddenly, Mason himself interrupted their conversation and asked what they were whispering about. Becca, without thinking twice, jumped into his bed and told him that she wanted to sleep with him. Mason didn't even suspect her intentions and said that she didn't even need to ask about it because he would gladly take her to his bed. Melanie wanted to save him from death and said that she also wanted to sleep with him. Mason couldn't even believe that he was so lucky and said that there was enough space for both girls. Mason's happiness knew no bounds. Who would have thought that two cute young girls would sleep with him just because he brought them some food from the supermarket? Becca lay down, pressing herself tightly against him. And Melanie lay like a tin soldier, not sharing Becca's opinion at all. As soon as Mason fell asleep, Becca took a sickle from under the blanket. She wanted to finish Mason off unceremoniously with one blow. But Melanie kicked the sickle out of her hands. 
Melanie's foot not only knocked the sickle out of Becky's hands, but also hit Mason right in the stomach. He woke up again and asked why Melanie sat on top of him. Melanie said she wanted to sleep with him alone. In this case, she would be able to ensure his safety if someone suddenly wanted to attack him. Mason agreed with her, because safety is above all else. And yet the night passed without injuries for Mason. Becca sat down next to Mason and asked him how much he had evolved. Mason replied that he was just an ordinary handsome guy and had not evolved at all. Then Becca asked how he managed to climb the skyscraper. Mason immediately asked how she knew this. She said she had a pretty keen sense of smell and when he came, she could smell everything. She started pretending to be a shy little girl and said that only the strongest evolved people could get out of that building alive and how Mason did it. For now, he couldn't talk about the program, he could only lie. He said that he got a little lost yesterday and only thanks to the revolver that Melanie gave him, he was able to survive. This meant that Mason was a good shot and Melanie suggested that he try shooting at the range. Mason began shooting awkwardly, but missed the target even once. Melanie asked if he was aiming for the target. How could he shoot so badly? He even held the gun incorrectly. Melanie came up behind him, took his hand and offered to teach him how to shoot correctly. First, I needed to relax my shoulder. There was no need to keep the body in such a tense state. You need to stand still and only now can you aim. And only now the shot. A hit, but not exactly on target. Mason was as happy as a child that he was able to hit the target. The program started and reported that an upgrade was available for ranged weapon proficiency. Now it became clear to Mason that there were other skills in the system, but points were needed for improvement, but he had none left. There was only one core from the Red Mutant, but these points were better spent on movement. Without thinking twice, Mason asked Melanie if there was a place where he could buy mutant cores. Melanie said that there is a place where you can exchange valuables for cannonballs. It is two kilometers from here. Mason was pleased to hear this and asked her to take him there. A few hours of traveling around the city and they were already there. Melanie knocked on the chain link fence and they entered immediately. One-eyed Alex was sitting there reading a newspaper. He was a local merchant who had almost everything your heart desires, but it didn't come cheap. As soon as they appeared in Alex's field of vision, he immediately pointed his gun at them. He didn't recognize Melanie at first and saw an unfamiliar Mason. She asked him if the old warrior was really afraid of zombies. Alex said that he wasn't afraid of zombies, he was more afraid of living people. Mason got straight to the point, asking if Alex could sell him the cores. Alex immediately asked what he would get for these cores. Mason placed three cans of preserves on the table. Alex couldn't believe his eyes. These were canned goods from the beginning of the 21st century. There weren't many left. Alex was just about to take them when Mason intercepted the canned goods from him and said that first he should show him the cannonballs. The one-eyed man took a drag on his cigarette and said that you couldn't fool him. At first glance, he was a fool, but in fact, he was smart. Mason said that at the very beginning of the conversation, Alex correctly noted that it is not zombies that you need to be afraid of, but people. So you should always be on guard. Alex told them to wait. He would bring everything they needed now. He was gone for a few minutes, and he put a bag of kernels on the table. He said that these were all the kernels he had, 11 in total. Alex said he would give two kernels for a can of expired meat, but Mason had prime meat, so he would give four kernels for one can, making 12, but he had 11, so he offered to make a deal now and give the rest later. Mason said he didn't have to pay anything back and he would also give Alex a fourth jar on top, but he will have one request. Mason took out the ingot and asked Alex what kind of metal it was. The old man looked at the ingot and said that his eyesight was not the best, but it looked like gold. Great. Mason took the ingot back and said that the old man's eyesight was fine. An extra can of stew is a commission because Alex probably knows a lot of people and asked to warn everyone so that they would look for gold for him. And in return, he would give them stew. Alex said that this trading plan sounded quite profitable, but he couldn't understand why he needed gold since it had long since ceased to be profitable. Mason told Alex not to worry about it. The more gold, the better. Mason was finally able to recharge his charge and he had 24 skill points. He immediately improved his ranged weapon skill by four levels, leaving him with only nine skill points and the new ability he received, Doom Bullet. Mason decided to test his newly acquired skill. Now he shot confidently at the target. Every shot he fired was right on target. This is the real level of a skilled shooter. Mason asked the program what this new Fatal Bullet ability was. The program replied that this skill could be used for free only once a day. Mason agreed and asked how he could use this skill. The program said that first you need to say the cry, the fatal bullet, and then shoot. Mason asked what kind of stupid rules are these? Why does he have to scream when using this skill he is not a superhero? 
The program said that people like to use the name of the technique before doing it. This method has been used for centuries according to human habits. Mason looked around to make sure no one was watching him. Like a real karateka, he began performing the technique, first standing in a stance. Now the gun goes up, the fatal bullet shouted out loudly, after which he immediately fired a shot. Both sisters watched Mason's pirouettes and they were not quite sure what kind of training he was doing. Mason looked into the distance. The bullet hit the neighboring building. He looked at the place where the bullet hit for several minutes, but nothing happened and it was unclear what the difference was. As Mason walked inside the shelter, he was thinking that he should study his skills better. He immediately noticed how the girls were cleaning up and freeing up a room for him. He immediately noticed that Melanie was carrying four huge boxes herself and said that he was ready to help because they were incredibly heavy. Melanie said that she didn't need help because for the evolved, such weight was not a problem at all. Mason immediately asked if all the evolved ones were so incredibly strong. Almost all of them, Melanie answered, at least they are much stronger than ordinary survivors, but there are very few who were able to evolve. Mason was fired up by the idea and asked what it would take to become evolved. Melanie thought for a moment and said there were three ways to do this. The first way is to survive the infection that entered the blood after a bite. But there were many such cases during the outbreak of the virus, but now you won't find anything like that. The second way was to swallow the core, and if you didn't get blown up, there was a 10% chance you would become evolved. The third method requires evolution potions. She heard that large organizations have such potions. Here it is, Mason was delighted, because he could exchange a lot of food for such potions. Melanie said that she could take him to try his luck in the unification of the buildings of the mainland. They are not like in the 17th camp, they need benefit, so they might be able to exchange such potions. Mason completely agreed with her and said that they were moving out tomorrow. A new sunny day has arrived. They were already leaving and Mason asked why Becca wasn't coming with them. And lately he began to think that she was looking at him strangely, but Melanie reassured him, saying that she was looking at him like that because of her poor eyesight. They walked down the street, and Mason noticed that there were more and more zombies near the base. Melanie said that it would take time to clear the area of them. Meanwhile, Becca was shooting at the target. She was angry that Melanie wouldn't let her kill Mason. At some point, the neighboring building began to collapse. She looked at this spectacle with surprise, but why it fell apart like a house of cards was not clear. They moved further and further along the city streets. There were a huge number of zombies there. It was necessary to act quietly so as not to attract the attention of the mutants and the rest of the horde. At some point, they came to a garage. Mason had not been here before. Melanie opened the garage where a good armored car was parked. She said that she had set up another supply point in this garage just in case. Then they would go by car, and in about two hours, they would arrive at the camp of the Association of Builders of the Mainland. They were driving fast on the highway and some zombies were trying to catch up with them. Mason warned Melanie that there were several zombies chasing them, but Melanie didn't care. She was sure that they would lose them. Melanie asked if Mason was sure of his decision, because even if he used the highest level potion, there was a chance that he would die. Mason said he wasn't sure, but the main purpose of their trip was to exchange goods. First, they needed to see what they had to trade. According to Melanie, this camp was also some kind of trading organization, but there is no guarantee that they will not be killed and all the goods will not be taken. So you need to trade a little at first, and then watch their reaction. While Mason was filled with thoughts about trading, a zombie appeared right in front of his face. It was a whole group of red zombies that were quickly catching up with their car. Melanie told him to quickly get his gun out and shoot. With their powerful, sharp hands, the zombies went through the car like a sieve. Mason kept shooting but couldn't hit even one zombie. He didn't understand what the problem was. He was a skilled shooter. Melanie said that they were super fast red zombies that could dodge bullets. Melanie told Mason to get behind the wheel and drive as fast as he could. They quickly changed and Melanie was already on the roof of the car. The zombie rushed at her and she rushed at the zombie but she still had her saw in her hands. After that meeting, the zombie simply fell apart in half. However, there were a lot of mutants and this was clearly not going to be an easy walk. Melanie jumped off the car, cutting another mutant in half. She fell onto the asphalt after sliding several meters on her back. However, this was just what the mutants were waiting for. It was incredibly difficult to stand up to such a number of powerful mutants. Melanie began to realize that her chances of being wounded were zero. And before the final attack, she simply closed her eyes. But as soon as she opened them, she saw Mason in front of her. He stood with a pistol in his hands and all the red mutants were lying around them. It was of course very dangerous, one more moment and I would not have made it in time, Mason said. He immediately saw that Melanie had fallen from the roof of the car and the creatures were rushing at her. 
Mason immediately stopped the car and rushed to help. He had a well-developed climbing skill, which gave him the ability to develop enormous speed. And if these zombies could easily dodge bullets, then what can they do if a gun is in their face? This was the only way to kill several zombies at once. Melanie realized that Mason was strong. He managed to kill several red zombies at once. His strength was equal to the first level of the evolved one. At this time, Mason, as a child, began to collect cores from mutants, saying that now he would be able to improve his abilities. He was looking for the cores but couldn't find them. Melanie stopped him. She asked him to look around. Thousands of zombies were moving towards them from all sides. But where did so many of them come from? They were probably attracted by the shots. They clearly needed to leave there as quickly as possible. They both quickly ran to the car, shooting back at the approaching zombies. Mason kept shooting, but Melanie asked him to save his bullets. There weren't enough of them to kill everyone anyway. However, they couldn't drive now either. The car was simply stuck in a huge horde of dead, stinking zombies, ready to die for a piece of fresh human flesh. The entire car was surrounded by an incredible number of zombies who wanted only one thing, to get the flesh of the people inside. Mason asked Melanie how many bullets she had left, to which she replied that she didn't have as many as she wanted. The guy took the magazines out of the gun, and after looking, it turned out that he only had 10 bullets left. This crowd cannot be taken down with such a quantity of bullets. In such conditions, the guy can only use a fatal bullet. Previously, the system said that the free fatal bullet could only be used once a day. The guy was worried because he didn't know for sure if he would be able to get that fatal bullet. As it turned out, when I first bought the fatal bullet, it cost one skill point for each shot, after which I didn't think twice and bought seven shots. The gun sparkled with purple rays, which meant that the guy had acquired bullets. Mason decided that he would leave the remaining two skill points for transfer. If eight shots did not help, then he would move to his own time. Well, a split second later he remembered that he was not alone in the car. Melanie was next to him, and she definitely couldn't get out of this hell alone. After all, she would simply die here. She would not be able to physically cope with this crowd of zombies alone. At this time, the girl said that the car was strong. For some time, they would definitely not be able to penetrate. The girl got furious because she told him to save bullets. But in the end, the guy spent all the bullets, and the zombies didn't really decrease. But at that moment, the guy just laughed at the girl's words. Melanie said that you should always leave at least one bullet just in case, because it might come in handy. But Mason couldn't understand the girl's words because how could one bullet be of any use? The girl began to tell that she always saves the last bullet. She wouldn't want to let these creatures bite her and then turn into a zombie. The last bullet should be left for yourself. In this world, death is at every step. The girl has long been ready to die at any moment. She just wouldn't want her death to be so sad. So she advises the guy to always leave at least one bullet. The guy didn't really react to the girl's words but just looked at her nervously. No effect. Mason fired seven fatal bullets, but nothing special happened. The zombies remained outside, and in addition there were more and more of them. At this time, the zombies continued to break into the car, hoping to feast on human flesh. After some time, raindrops began to fall on the zombie's head. It started raining, at least the boy and girl won't have to worry about dying of thirst. Now they can only pray that there are other people nearby who can distract the zombies, but there are definitely no such kind people. It's clear that the zombies didn't care about this rain, the guy noticed that a stench suddenly started, but as it turned out, the rotten meat on the zombie's body gets wet from the water. There is always such a stench during the rain. As it turned out, the partners came up with a cunning plan. They placed buckets under the roof of the car to collect water. The buckets were already full and they needed to patch up the hole in the roof. It was raining quite heavily. The girl hadn't seen anything like it for a long time. If it continued for another day, they might see something interesting. The guy couldn't understand what the girl meant by the word interesting. Zombies themselves are immortal, but water can wash them away. So right now they are watching the zombies melt before their eyes. When water hits them, their skin swells, making it seem as if they are living people again. However, this was only temporary. At this time, the rain was not going to stop. On the contrary, dark thick clouds with rain were gathering around the car and a crowd of zombies. They continue to absorb water, the skin continues to swell. To such an extent that at some point it can't take it anymore and bursts, the zombies still won't die from this. They'll just look a little more interesting. The guy asked the girl to stop, because from her story and that smell, he would definitely throw up, and then they would both be uncomfortable sitting in the car. But in any case, it was better to sit in the car like this than outside with a crowd of zombies. The girl asked the guy to look out the window. The girl noticed that all the zombies on the outside began to look more like people. This is indeed true. Almost all the zombies had all the outlines and characteristics of a person. 
After one zombie, who was a girl, leaned towards the mirror, the girl noticed that she looked the same age as she was. The girl would still be alive if the world were normal. In Melanie's words, there was a sense of resentment and sadness for what happened to this world, and specifically to this girl. But the girl's reasoning was interrupted by Mason, who asked her what she would do if the world were normal. The girl was surprised by such a sudden and at the same time difficult question. The girl didn't think much about it. If there were no zombies, if the world was normal, then she would. She would have liked to become a pastry chef, but she felt it wasn't really suited to her. Well, the guy had a different opinion. He said that such a profession would suit her. It's not strange because the guy knew better because he lived and can live in a normal world. A few seconds later, a powerful bolt of lightning flashed across the sky, almost illuminating the entire clearing where the girl and boy were. The guy can't leave Melanie, there has to be another way. The guy decided that he would gain strength during the day and then try to use the climbing ability to escape with Melanie right over the heads of these zombies. A split second later, the partner's faces were covered by a powerful flash of lightning, which clearly surprised them a little. What a dense flash. This area was always dry, the girl had never seen such weather here. But the lightning was not going to stop. On the contrary, it took on an unnatural appearance and was directed straight at the car with the girl and the guy. The flash was so bright that the main characters even shielded themselves from it. After a few seconds, she finally reached her target and hit the car. A moment later, dozens, if not hundreds, of zombies were struck down by the same lightning, causing them to fly off in all directions. After the guy opened his eyes, he saw dead zombies lying in front of him. Such a picture clearly amazed the guy almost to the point of losing consciousness. And, oddly enough, the zombies were all dead. From such a powerful discharge of electricity, the girl and the guy still couldn't believe what had just happened, because it was the first time they saw all the zombies around them killed by one lightning strike. Well, even though the zombies were dead, the partner had to clear the road of zombies, otherwise the car wouldn't be able to pass. By the time they finished cleaning, it was already clear. They were probably still a little shocked by what had happened. The guy was indescribably happy that they were able to survive under such circumstances, but the girl was also incredibly happy. At this time, they reached some huge gates, a man at the post above told his partner that a car was approaching and that he needed to report it to the guard, after which the partner went to report it. Meanwhile, the guard himself was sleeping soundly, along with two gorgeous girls, and against the backdrop of all this, the man was shouting for the guard to wake up because the car was at the gate. The guard reluctantly went outside, adjusting his pants, and complained about the person who had arrived so early. The man asked permission to find out everything. Opening a small gap in the gate, the man told everyone to get out of the car. The main characters approached the gate. The man said that he had not seen them before and asked where they were coming from, also adding whether they were looking for shelter. Mason said that they were traitors and had come to exchange very valuable things, and the girl simply watched and remained silent. The guard, at this time, having thrown his coat over himself, told them to get the goods, and he would look at it. The man gave the guard the boy's goods in exchange. He looked with interest at the canned food that the guy brought, he unpacked the goods with the hope of trying them out, but the girl was outraged by the man's behavior because they had not yet received anything in return. She could not understand why he was already opening it, but Mason interrupted the girl and said that it was okay. The man would just try the product. He asked her to try it quickly and tell him how he liked it. The man said that the guy was smarter than he seemed. The man swallowed a juicy piece of meat while one of the men present looked at all this and was clearly hungry. The man decided to try it again. He raised the spoon to his mouth and took a swallow. At this time, the men standing nearby asked him how it tasted and choked on their saliva, because they were not just hungry but most likely dying of hunger. The guy took another spoon. The girl was again outraged by the guy's behavior. She thought that was enough, because he was close to eating the whole jar. The man didn't understand what it was. He took a couple of spoons, and it was already finished. He said that he couldn't even taste the product. But the guy said that it was okay. He had more and held out the can so that the man could try it. A few minutes later, several empty cans were lying on the table, containing absolutely nothing at all. The girl was furious about this, because the man had already eaten eight cans. She asked if he knew how many good things they could exchange for them. With a bloated belly, the guy reported that he had eaten quite a lot, after which he added that he was leaving the broth for the men standing nearby. A split second later, they began to fight, not literally, for this broth, which looked very strange and ridiculous from the outside. The man said that the canned food was quite tasty. He ordered the mayor of the city to be notified about the guy and girl, after which the man ordered him to follow him, after which he led them to the estate, where there were a lot of people. It felt like this place did not feel the zombies outside. At this time, 
Someone asked whether people did not want to look. Someone said that they had the highest quality goods. Mason asked if there were people living in these houses, to which he was told that they were all refugees, whom the mayor of the city had warmly welcomed, if it were not for him. Then sooner or later they would all have become victims of the zombies. A man fell right to the floor in front of the heroes. As it turned out, he didn't just fall down. He was beaten by some guy who accused him of stealing medicine and promised that he would get it from him now. As it turned out, this someone was a girl with red hair who asked to spare her and said that she would not steal anything else. Mason immediately ran up to the guy who was beating the girl and asked him to go easy, so that they could discuss everything calmly. He couldn't understand why he was using his hands. But the man was furious and asked the guy if he even knew what she had done. He said that the girl had stolen medicine from the warehouse. Medicine is more important to them than food. Unauthorized use of medicine is punishable by death. All it takes is for the head of the city to order it, and they will not leave a single living place on the girl. The man said that the girl dared to steal so much, but it was good that he managed to catch her. He asked her where she hid the medicine and ordered her to give it back quickly. The man told the boy that people from the outside world should not worry about this. The thief would be given an appropriate sentence, after which he added that they should follow him further. After which the man dragged the girl with him into the courtroom. The man was interested in what punishment the girl would receive in court. The man said that the mayor was busy today, so he would not be able to receive them. There was a guest room on the second floor. The man handed over the key and said that the mayor would receive them tomorrow. The next day arrived. An elderly woman walked around the estate and asked if people had seen her granddaughter. After the grandmother asked the man again whether he had definitely not seen her, he aggressively told her to get lost and also added that he was late for work in the mine. After which the grandmother approached some stranger and began to report that her granddaughter had red hair, a small braid, and also added that she had been missing since yesterday evening. Mason noted that the girl they saw yesterday was probably her granddaughter, but the man told the guy not to worry because she would be informed about everything. But Mason decided not to wait and went up to the grandmother, after which he told her that her granddaughter had stolen the medicine. So now she was in the courthouse and advised her to ask there. From the expression on the man's face, it was clear that he was slightly unhappy about this. The grandmother began to blame herself, arguing that the girl had stolen the medicine to cure her illness, and if anyone needed to be taken into custody, it was her. She believed that since she had taken these medicines, she should be the one to be tried. But the guy's dialogue was interrupted by a man who said that they needed to go, otherwise they would be late for a meeting with the mayor. The man walked into the building and announced in his head that the merchant named Mason had arrived. At this time, the chief was eating and told him to come in. Entering the room, the guy saw five guards in front of him, the head of the city, and two women sitting near the head while he was eating. The guy said that he was that very merchant. The man said that his trading principle is that he only exchanges with people he knows. But according to the security, the canned goods that the guy brought were very good. The chief asked if this was really true. Mason said that he also has fresh canned meat, and everyone who hasn't tried it liked it. He added that the head of the company could try it too. A few seconds later, canned food was brought to the chief on a tray. He opened one of the valuable jars, after which he threw in the entire can at once and not like the man on the post did, who ate it in small pieces with a spoon. The head began to chew. Suddenly, he instantly grabbed all the canned goods at once, which could not help but surprise everyone present, after which he squeezed the canned food and began to eat it, to be honest, like some kind of pig. After the man chewed, he said that it was simply delicious. This meat was tens of thousands of times better than what he usually eats. He asked how many more cans the guy had. He takes everything and gives in exchange whatever he wants. It goes without saying that the guy was happy with this news and also added that the boss knows a lot about the product. The man insisted that the boy say what he wanted to receive in return. The guy was brief. He said that he needed cores, an evolution potion, and also gold. But the boss clearly didn't understand what gold was after which a subordinate ran up to him and began to explain what gold actually was. A few seconds later, the man with a smile on his face said that of course he would have gold, because in this world it is one of the most unnecessary things. The chief ordered the man to go with the guy to the warehouse, pick up the goods and collect for him what they give in return. But the guy interrupted the leader and said that he had one more request. It is clear that the boss did not understand what request the guy was talking about. Mason started to tell that yesterday a girl stole medicine from his warehouse, now she is in the courthouse. The guy said that he will give him three times more medicine as compensation for the damages. He only asked to let her go. The boss asked his subordinate if this was really true, to which he told what had happened, and also added that the thief had already been taken into custody 
and the judge had sentenced her to prison. The chief thought, since the guy is ready to compensate their losses threefold, then the chief remains in the black. After the deal is completed, the guard will take the guy to the courthouse to free the girl. The guy thanked the chief. The subordinate gave the guy a box and said that it contained what he asked for in exchange for the goods in an equivalent amount, 10 gold bars, 100 cores, and two evolution potions. Now the guy has hundreds of cores, and he can upgrade a bunch of abilities, but now the first thing he needs to do is go to his time and exchange these ingots for money. Even though the guy doesn't know how much it all costs, he's definitely rich now. The man also gave the guy a leaflet and said that there was an order for the girl's release, and he also added that he would take the guy to the courthouse. But the guy couldn't understand where Melanie was. He suspected that she was already waiting for him at the entrance. And at this time, people gathered in the square and looked at something very worriedly, and fear was visible in their eyes. The bloody feet were visible to everyone present. You could tell from the people that they were truly scared. 